studio this morning. He was with us. He was supposed to be with us a few weeks back, but of course, um, Lagos happened, traffic happened, and then we had to do a telephone conversation, which wasn't too clear. But today, based on popular demand, we have him live in the studio. Um, this morning, my guests. He's an indigenous of Elijah Ondo State in southwestern Nigeria. He was born in the Niger Delta region of the country, where he was raised in a polygamous home with 16 other children. At age 12, he learned how to ride a motorbike, a motorcycle, so he could fish at a lake, you know, to be able to provide for his entire family every morning before going to school. He's a graduate of geography and regional planning from the University of Lagos, where he was keenly involved in anti cultism and anti corruption advocacy. He's also a master's degree holder in public administration from the Columbia University. In 1989, he took part in the student protests, you know, that um, protest against conditions of the IMF. Um, loan of $120 million that was used or that was supposed to be used, I beg your pardon, for the oil pipeline in Nigeria. Among other conditions of the IMF loan were to reduce the number of universities from the uh, from 25, from 20 rather, I beg your pardon, to, to 5. His passion and desire for media was propelled during the military rule and in 20 2006, he began Sahara Reporters in a small room in Manhattan to fight against corruption and government practices. On February 25, 2018, he announced his intention to run for president of the prestigious nation called Nigeria. He is also the candidate of the AAC. Welcome this morning to the show, everybody. Mr. Omoyele Showare. Thank you. So, really good morning, sir. Thank you so much for Great being here. Great to have you this show. morning. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You made a huge sacrifice coming here this morning. Yeah. I mean, you've flown from Nigeria to Australia back, yes. some something asked journey, and here you are in the studio live. It took me three Looking days to tired. Get to Australia. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Thanks for coming, sir. Yes. We are humbled by your by your appearance. Now, let's quickly go in, Mr. Shawari. Time is not our friend this morning. We want to cover all we can within this limited time. I have now, a lot of questions. Definitely, definitely <laughs> loads of questions. Now, you were born in the Niger region of the country. Yeah. Even though you Hill from Elijah Seldo. Okay. Seldo. It used to be Elijah Seldo, local West. Now, now. Seldo. Yeah. Okay. Can I'm you actually us... a boy. Yeah, I'm a job boy from one of those days. Okay. Can you give us a background to your to your growing up? Because according to your story, family of two we were twenty at the point. Wow. Twenty kids at the point. So, so some sixteen of us are survived. So survived. survived. Wow. Yeah. So I'm the first son of a family, first child. Okay. Yeah, okay. of uh, polygamous family. My dad uh, has straight wife. So how was it growing up in that polygamous family? How yeah. was it for you having, you know, to basically, quote unquote, compete with several other kids from your from your parents? If, if it was competition, it would have been great. I had to, I mean, I had to care for them. I had to mm. be. I was mostly responsible for helping the other kids grow up. Uh, there will be times I would left with all these kids at home when my parents go out to farm or go fishing and some of the times some of them are sick, I have malaria, they'll be crying and they'll be fighting, struggling, you know, some mm -hmm. of them, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it was tough, it was mm -hmm. tough uh, just uh, being responsible, you know, I was, I think I grew up as a parent too early in life, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was part of the parenting, I wasn't competing with anybody, nobody was competing with me. <laughs> so at the 12, you were already fishing for your younger I ones to, to have nine, nine years old. old. Nine years wow. Old. Yeah. But I, you know, I had the opportunity of riding the bike to the lake at 12. Mm -hmm. Yes. That means from, from that end age you're taking the responsibility of, of being, you know, responsible for your for your siblings. That's right, that's right. All right, that's amazing. Tell us about your schooling, Mr. Shore. Uh, I school I think I homeschooled at first. Okay. Homeschooling meant that I traveled with my dad who was a teacher. Okay. So we'll travel on a canoe to wherever he's transferred and uh, Whenever we get to class, you know, he'll dress me up and go to school. Okay. And I'll be moving from class to class, you know, and refer to as a teacher. So son. you were not putting on uniforms, you just go from class to class? And, you know, I had, I didn't have uniforms. <laughs> he just sat, you know, sat on a lap of so mistresses and not, not his mistresses, but we call them mistresses. <laughs> I understand. You know, so because they, you know, they like me a lot. And okay. so I go from class to class. Whenever I was friendly, that way I'll be in their class. And so, but at home, my dad would uh, teach us whatever I start to primary one kids or primary two when it was second year and then they will force us to do homework assignment okay. and then we'll go for a siesta okay. and so that was pretty elitist growing up but it didn't last mm. it didn't last mm. yes so what happened what happened along the way oh man the Nigerian economy kept in mm. I would say and then they stopped paying teachers their salaries even though then the salary wasn't enough to maintain the family, but you know, he had some of that gigs on the side. Okay. Uh, his sister, my mom, had a kiosk in a village, so mm -hmm. we had extra income. 
but over time, as Nigeria unraveled, uh, things uh, began to fall apart. So, what secondary school did you did you go to? I attended the secondary school in my village, as community high school. Okay. Okay. I was one of the first students, in but we we went to a school that we built ourselves. Wow. Uh, when Obafemi, the of family that will free education policy touched us in 1980, okay. they brought the school there. Okay. It was just a, it was barren land and the paperwork, and they asked us to go and do the work. So we were the ones who molded the blocks and then mm. so the you had the builders and also the students. Yes. Uh, so when we finished building the school, we just became students in the school. But, um, <laughs> That's so, interesting. That's yeah. interesting. So then from there you went to Unilag. Yeah, I went, yeah, I went from there to not to Unilag. After I finished secondary school at the age of fourteen, I was too young okay. and I didn't do too well. I'm not uh, shy to say that. Okay. So my father returned me back to secondary school, another secondary school, Fede Play. Comprehensive High School in okay. uh, in Okitwukwa, not far from my village. Spent two years there before I did why I did well, mm. and then I applied to Jam. I wrote Jam twice, mm. and eventually uh, came to Unilag, 1989. Okay. okay, so the journey for you for tips and began in Unilag. I didn't, well, I would say it began at home, uh, okay. but I didn't have any chance to be an activist other than doing things that kids shouldn't do, like listening to Fela. Uh, <laughs> so. Yes, I, I remember in, when Fela came out with Zombie, mm -hmm. I was one of the people who secretly listened and liked it. Okay. You know, and uh, so I was asking, who is this fella? And then my dad used to bring in newspapers whenever he went to collect salaries. So he would bring in Sketch and Tribune. Okay. And I saw stories about Fela, I would read them, and he was like, I hope I, I hope this guy, I hope they don't kill this guy, so mm -hmm. I wonder I'll meet him. And I eventually met him at the University of Lagos in 1992, okay. 19, I think it was 1994, 1992. Okay. Yes. So and then I uh, became a big fan ever since then. But um, it was a very interesting life. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got to Inla, it was the first time I came in contact with people that you refer to as real activists. Mm -hmm. You know, people like Femi Falano, okay. Bamidele Aturu, Chima Obani, uh, Wenga Lawepo now. And uh, several activists who were student activists at that time. Mm -hmm. At the University of Lagos, outside of Inla, we used to come around and I met Chief Gandhi following me. Later, Ben Kaur and some Kuti, Akaba Shorun, Lisa Bakoba, Yobe. You know, I've been, you know, I, I'm friends with all of them. And then you, you had your academic um, journey punctured by two years for activism's sake? Yeah, that, that, I, it wasn't punctured. I would say, you know, I was expelled twice. Okay. But my expulsion only lasted for as long as the school was closed. Okay. Uh, and the school was closed so many times during that period uh, due to Astro Strike or closure based on student protest okay and i engaged in a lot of those mm. so why, why was i mean why were you expelled twice i was expelled first in 1992 uh because we had babangida moscow protest okay and all the student leaders who led the protest uh, were expelled mm. 47 of us in those days okay. led by olusha gumaye who was nas president he was arrested uh with ganifa and mifala and those of us who led the protest were also uh, expelled from the university okay and in 1994 after we had a huge anti-court campaign and I was attacked physically, uh, the school authorities expelled me, mm. you know, alongside the court guys that were fighting against. Now, go going by all those incidences, yes. were there times your parents spoke to you and said, my son, look, you have to cut down on these your activities. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. causing a lot of harm. Were there times they spoke to you to cut down on your, you know, your protests and all that? Absolutely. Uh, okay. My dad came to, well, the first time I was expelled, they sent a letter to me. To embarrass the entire village to mm. understand that look, the guy you sent to, to Lagos to school is doing uh, something else. Has flunked out of school, <laughs> and just to serve as a lesson to others who may be in the village who want to do the same inspired thing. by my, mm. according to them, wayward lifestyle. Mm. So they took the letter to the village. You know, imagine in Nigeria where letters couldn't travel to any village. It went all the way to the village. Went, and they made sure it was delivered overnight. Mm. You know, I don't know how it got there. My father took the letter after reading it in the village meeting and the family meeting and came to Lagos uh, to see my uncle and say, you know, threw the letter to my on my uncle's table. I was still at first. Like, I knew I was a spur, but I didn't tell anybody. Mm. So I was just living like a normal person. So how do your father feel when he, when he got that letter? So we, my, my, uncle's, my uncle said to my dad, you know, it's impossible. I, I was in the same house with this guy. It's the nicest guy in the him. world, it's cool. As I had like a holiday gig at that time around zero. So he mm. said he goes to work and comes back. If you ask him to do anything, he'll do it. I, I don't believe this is a mistake. So mm. my father followed me to Yenlag. 
As I about to enter the elevator, he saw posters pasted everywhere. I was running for president of Student Union then, mm. and my my slogan was when he, when um, uh, when uh, sorry, I think it was like uh, when circumstances are difficult, you know, only the extraordinary stands. Mm -hmm. okay. so, okay. You know, when circumstances are beyond the ordinary, only that. My father read it and he said, "Yeah, are you the one who wrote this?" Mm. I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "This is the reason they expel you." But he still didn't believe it, so he took me upstairs to see the dean of my faculty. Okay. And the dean told him I'll try that, you know. That's your son, they're looking for him because he's planning to overthrow the government. So my dad ran out of the dean's office because I didn't enter the office with him. I knew that the dean could call the police on me. Mm -hmm. Then came out and said, Look, I've just confirmed that, you know, they're not going to leave this expulsion. You have committed crime of the biggest proportion. They're trying to overthrow the government. It's like treason. So would you say those songs of Fela in those days actually had a large influence, you know, on your life? Oh, absolutely. I, I think so. I, you know, I already made up my mind about the military when I was 10 years old because uh, my village was invaded by the police okay. and a lot of bad things happened that night. So the songs, I said, listen to them more, you know, because Fela's songs have two dimensions, I have to tell you. Mm. There's the lyrics which most people don't listen to yeah and then this beat the beat which is a point and, and the third aspect of it is fella's own character his personality yeah personality that most people just most people who are talking about fella have never listened to his lyrics mm -hmm. they just know the beat and they know his reputation like this crazy guy you know but i listened to his lyrics very early in life and okay. i was like wow that's amazing you know? and to understand that he would do the songs like zombie and stand his ground i was like mm -hmm. yeah. Inspiration, there is no doubt about it. But I also listen to other people. But in spite of and most people, I listen to myself a lot. Okay. In spite of those experiences, you still went ahead, you know, to 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 organize several other protests. Absolutely. What what inform all that? You were not deterred by 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 the expulsion and all that. No. I each time they expelled us, we will go back to school and organize even bigger protests mm -hmm. to get reinstated. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in 1994, when we were expelled along the cold guys, when we came back to school, they thought we, they didn't even think I would come back. They thought that would have been scared. So we came back, organized a massive rally on campus. And that rally attracted, you know, the attention of the military authorities because in one of the rallies we had a, an exam boycott. Okay. The next day after the school resumed, and I find, figured out how to enter the campus because they had signs all over the place that I was wanted and there were like five hundred policemen at the gate of the university. Mm -hmm. I got in. We had a massive rally. And the next day, uh, late um, Michael Higbe used to be, I think he was a chief of uh, general staff or he was a deputy leader of the military and he was also a law student. So we went to his class and he was writing an exam, you yeah. know, of course, protected with guards. And uh, the students went in there and they made a mess of the exam. Mm -hmm. And he called the VC right there. He's like, I thought you were going to solve the problem. So by afternoon, the vice chancellor wrote the press, the school authorities wrote the press that we've we'll been granted amnesty. So we're the first set of people to get amnesty in this amnesty. country, you know. Okay. But in addition to that, they also granted the court guard amnesty. Oh. So that was in the, in that was the initial intention anyway to make sure that you know because the court guys were the kids, the children of the rich and the powerful. Okay, I, I think the, the height of your detention or, or your 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 um, your protest came when you protested in 1998 um, and then you were kept by by sars operative yes so uh, yeah there was uh, the nuga games in 1998 okay. and uh, i'd already graduated did my OIC and um, but a lot of students were expelled mm. and the military abila had died at this point abacha died and the military the Busalam government uh, had not looked into the case of this victim okay. accident so i woke up one day and went to in like at the nuga games and we started a small protest at the gates uh, of uh, the sports center and then we were able to force ourselves in okay. and disrupted the games and the led to, what's the reason for that it was to force them to discuss the issue of expulsion of all the student activities across the country okay yes uh so it was so it it, it generated very quickly because there were too many military people around you know flexing muscles mm -hmm. and we had so many students around us so who were willing to take them on and it was our territory so uh mike ahibi stood up he was uh he was the second in command of salam at that time okay and uh, as i was speaking and saying to them that they said they addressed the issue we can't allow the games he stood up he's a, he's a very temperamental person 
he came towards me apparently as he was approaching me you know i had myself guarded you know uh, so he ran into my elbow and mm -hmm. staggered backwards and you know he almost fell and his guys just like uh, wondering what kind of a front race this, you know. Uh, and they, they pointed nothing less than 30 guns at me at the same time. And I was just like this mosquito looking guy. They dropped me to the ground and uh, started dragging me. But the students were like surging towards us. Mm. And there was this uh, girl at that time, her name is Yemi, so they call him Yemi Sinoga. And they said, oh, she stood there and said, you are not taking show anywhere today. And they just couldn't understand that students had such their students had such courage. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we were taken to SARS, detained. Uh, I think it was for almost two weeks. Mm -hmm. They detained us as long as the games uh, lasted, mm -hmm. just just to ensure that we don't come back and do anything on campus. Yes. Okay. So it was shortly after that. Uh, I think a few months after that, that I traveled to the US in 1999. What, was it the detention that that made you think I've had enough of Nigeria and living this country? No, no, no. I, I, you know what I mean? It wasn't. I, okay. I, I, I become sick. That was one, and so I wanted to check up on my health outside of the country to be sure what was wrong with me. Because don't forget, at the University of Lagos, I was injected with an unknown substance when I was attacked in 1994. Mm. But you know, I was just too stubborn, to, and I was taking treatment at Lutz, and the police tried to abduct me from the hospital bed, so I had to be packaged out of Lutz, you know, sick, uh, to escape police abduction. Because I arrested the student union leaders led by Marco Fabi and several of them and charged them for armed robbery. Okay. So they wanted to get me and the, the, the information at that time was that if they got me, they would finish me off because I was the one who knew who all the court guys were mm. and who was leading the fight against courtism and they had become an embarrassment to the government. So, but, but I think, sorry to cut you, I think one of the interesting things about your story yeah. was your experience in 1993. Yeah. According to your story, you rejected 800,000 naira from Abiola. From Abiola. Yes, of course. I mean, a lot of people will be wondering what came over you. That, that was a large amount of money at that time. Yeah, it, uh, we were, not only was it a large amount of money, it probably would be equivalent to almost eight hundred thousand dollars today mm. yeah uh but it wasn't the first time as a student leader that i would be presented with such amounts such I mean, not gift when babangela was under you know a lot of trouble he, he gave out 505 pijo cars to student leaders across nigeria i was mm. one of the few people that rejected it so it wasn't new to me why did you reject this gift because i know that they were meant to compromise my integrity mm -hmm. and uh, prevent me or shut my mouth off or put me in a compromised position so that i can stand up what stand up for what i believe so i also knew that it was nigerian money stolen by these people that they're using to bribe people maybe in the case of abiola it might be slightly different you know but you know our position on abiola in general even before the election we were against abiola and uh, the ruling elite you know we everyone knew it was part of them what brought what drew us to June 12 was in Abiola's integrity was a position that was based upon our desire to have democratic rule and we thought, hey, you know, if we all, if you ask people to come and vote, whomever they, they, you know, they elect, they have the right to be led by that person. So, so what, 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 as I was, it has always been my character mm -hmm. to be comfortable with my poverty. But some people have this belief that everyone has a prize and yeah. that if the prize is big enough, you will compromise. Well, do you think, what do you think of, make of that, that, that saying? The, that the people who have those beliefs probably haven't been anywhere else, mm -hmm. but been around small things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. If, uh, if you have large enough conviction, uh, you will understand that there's no price that can buy integrity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, even Yorubas have uh, this saying that uh, you know if you are looking for money and you meet prestige on the way you should go back home because even when you get money you still need prestige yeah. to survive so, yeah. yeah right so in 2006 you started Sahara Reporters what That's informed correct. Sahara Reporters I was uh, because was, you didn't study mass communication I did, so yeah. what informed you going into the media business one it was technology I come okay. across okay. internet and found it to be an interesting way of communicating and I've always believed in mass communication. Okay. Second, it was a, a time that in the US, a lot of activists, especially young activists, were fighting against the World Trade uh, Organization, WTO, the World Bank in Seattle. Okay. And they weren't getting enough coverage from the regular media, mainstream media like CNN. And they focused more on the people wearing a uh, blue suit inside the conference and ignored the abuse, the torture, uh, and of the activists outside, mm. but somehow these activists kept their story in our life by publishing their own stories. Mm. So that was where the idea of report yourself came to me. You know, okay. and I found it to be interesting that what the independent media guys did with this, and I started thinking about how to apply it to Nigeria. 
Okay. And that was how the idea. That, so Harry Potter didn't start in 2006. It started okay. before 2004. Five, I think, okay. but I wasn't Sarah Potter at that time. I was with a guy known as Jonathan Elendu. So we, we were working together on Elendu reports. Okay. I was providing information about houses bought by all these Nigerian political office holders, including Atiku okay. at that time, Babaka Atiku, who bought a one point seven million house in the years, which finally he abandoned when they went after him. I uh, found a house uh, bought by Ojus or Kalu. We found houses bought by. Uh, uh, Benga, Daniel, Saraki, all these guys bought multi million dollar houses. And all, all these were confirmed? These they were confirmed. confirmed. Was, these, these in fact, they, they were so careless, they left their names on there. Mm. And the only person who didn't have his name directly on it was uh, Lucky Gwinnedon. Mm. Bought a house in London. He didn't put his name there. But how we caught him was that he registered for a gym membership. So they delivered the letter to the house in his name and we picked it up. That's how we were able to confirm that it was the house. And I think DSP Alamase also used an offshore account. I think Babangida son also had houses like that. But they have a way of shielding them, but it's easy to cash them. Mm -hmm. you know? But in those days, the impunity was much and they didn't care. They bought it directly under their names. Okay. And you could find their names on it, their addresses and, and things like that. We just have to know their address in London. In the US, it's public information. Mm -hmm. And then o over the years, you've been able to build Sarah reporters into a very reputable and respectable media organization. That's correct. Such that it's basically authoritative. Uh, people take news from Sarah reporters, hook, line, and sinker. That's right. How did you achieve that? How were you able to build such a reputation to, to be a trusted media uh, me media platform? I think a lot of people who who in, when who were in Nigeria at that time when we started, and even now, okay. we're always looking for reputable people to report issues mm. to. And I also found out that the Nigerian media were getting either they were self censoring or they were using it to do business. Mm. So when people found out, if, you know, after we did a few stories, did a few breaking stories, and they saw the courageous way we were reporting, we became the place to go. And what we ask people is to report yourself to us. And but it's important that you provide evidence of the report. Yeah, if the number is corrupt, we ask for bank account information, we ask for credit card information. And everybody became a reporter at that time. So mm -hmm. if they found a Nigerian official checking into a hotel, people would send us pictures, the pictures and the information that they're paying for it or how they're paying for it. There's some places where, you know, what they're even ordering for. You know, we, we had such amazing information in those days. And, uh, and we just kept publishing more and we kept getting incredible information. And on occasions where we can't, we would dig on our own. And over the, the years, over the years, you've made so many high profile revelations. Yes. Have there been any time where your life was endangered or threatened based on this this reportage? Oh I saw I, I you know I, I think every major story I did endangered my life somehow. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, when they can't reach me directly, of course they got me sued a few times. Uh, and then they say have they, they still get sued even till now by mm -hmm. pastors, politicians, anybody that is affected directly by these stories, or sometimes even indirectly, they hire top parties to uh, to sue me. So it's been like that. But you know what? I have always my life has always been threatened since I probably entered the University of Lagos in nineteen eighty nine, and that'll be thirty years by next year. Mm. You know, and whose life is safe here, anyways? Mm. So basically, very little is known about your family. Are you married? Do you have children? I have. Yes, I'm married. I've been married for fourteen. Are you years. deliberately shielding them from the media? Yeah, in, in some ways, you know, I, I just feel like if I don't have their permission to share their information, I, I know people can be very vicious. Mm. Uh, and you know, you have young kids, you want to shield them mentally and psychologically from those kind of vicious mm. uh, people. I, you know, I have a wife who wants to be private. She she has a job. She doesn't rely on me to live her own life, and she. You know, we both, I wouldn't say she requested, but we both agreed that she can be, she, that she's Nigerian too. You know, she wasn't born here, okay. but she grew up in Nigeria and attended school here. So I have two kids uh, that I know of. No. Now you know of? Yes. <laughs> All right, let's leave that. So the high point of this of this show basically is to talk about the values that have shaped people into who they are. I mean, from your discussion, basically we've picked up integrity is key to you. Mm. What other values have shaped you into the person you are and the person you're becoming over the years? I, you know, it's difficult to say their values. I think most of their experiences, mm. you know, experiences I've had, I've uh, just been thoroughly disappointed, you know, growing up in this country, knowing that every atrocity that was committed against myself, this, you know, colleagues that I had, 
experience that I saw in the streets, the education, so they were carefully planned and executed by an elite in this country. Mm -hmm. So each time that the education system is not working, it's because they wanted to privatize education. Each time they destroy public water pipelines or gas pipelines, mm -hmm. it's because it suits their own agenda. Each time they engage in oil bunkering or, you know, uh, even outrightly engage in crime, it's because, you know, of their own selfishness. Mm -hmm. So these things are what shaped me. You know, I was shaped more by experiences than honestly values because mm -hmm. when you talk about values, you're talking about you know things that people are built into maybe, you know, sometimes it could be religious, mm -hmm. it could be family. But I would say that honestly my father was a major influence in me. He never made me you know, any one of us feel like we needed to be rich, to be able to speak truth to power or, you know, to do what is right. So mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, again, I think the uh, most experience. All right. Uh, on, on, on the last time, Zishore, you offered yourself the presidency for this country. What informed that decision? I, I I decided to do that because I know that I can do a better job than all of these guys. That I have seen the seven president come and go since uh, 1980. I would say 89. Starting from Babangida to Shunel Khan, Abacha, to Abdul Salam, Abbasan Joe, after that, Jarad Dua. There was even a time this, gov this country was governed by a dead person for five months. I showed them <laughs> better than that. Uh, and then after that, Jonathan and then Buhari. You got to look at all these guys' record and know that a Shore that has been doing what is right for 30 years will do a better job. And you know, in addition to having the exposure, having the capacity and the character, and integrity, which we have talked about today, mm -hmm. like definitely, you know, and the stamina, all right? Uh, I can definitely never do a better job than any one of these guys. In the first presidential, that was when I was an aspirant, not a candidate, uh, to come out with, uh, you know, manifestos talking about what to do about Nigeria, and everybody is trying to catch up now. All right, Mr. Shore, thank you very much for coming on the show. Lagos, that's a wrap on the role model today. I'm sure you've picked some dose of motivation. Um, you can give life your best, and of course, you can be the best you can be in every field and any field you indeed find yourself. Mr. Shore, thanks for coming on the show this morning. Um, Lagos, that's a wrap on the show. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at IMAF for Impact, and of course, at Value Lines on Twitter and on Instagram. Till I come your way again next week, do have a wonderful, wonderful day. God bless you. Nigeria they use computer. The leaders of Nigeria they use radio where they turn the knob.